You're listening to Writing Roots, brought to you by Aspen House Publishing. Alrighty, welcome back. And we've had some good conversations so far this week. We were talking about building your characters the first day. We're talking about world building the second day. Today we're talking about notes and things you needed to keep track of while you're telling your story in order to make sure it feels real. Last time we we met on this uh, channel, Lee was talking about building your magic system. Today we're talking more about the physical elements of combat. This is probably a surprise to absolutely nobody, but one of my favorite things to do is kill people. Of course, I'm talking about killing characters. It's the whole mom thing. I can, if I can take you into the world, I can take you out. Same thing goes for writers. The first thing you need to think about when you're having these kinds of characters is the strategy. Specifically, a cornerstone strategy that defines the uniqueness of your character. They will approach their battles differently depending on their experience, depending on the lie they believe about themselves, depending on their own cornerstone memories and things that they failed in that cornerstone memory that they can come back with in their cornerstone strategy now. Of course, this saying, whatever this cornerstone strategy is, in video games, this is what the character is shouting as they're going into battle. If you played Baldur's Gate, I think it was two, um, there was a character who had a little hamster that he carried with him into battle. And so he would always shout, go for the eyes, boo, go for the eyes. That was his battle strategy and one he also communicated to his hamster. Some of my favorites include everyone keeps their kneecaps in the same place. This is something you can train for. You know the human body is behaving a certain way. Also, no one can train for every environment. So when you're talking about the environment surrounding your characters, the person who can train for and integrate as much of their environment as possible will have a leg up because the other person simply couldn't train for that environment and they're used to a dojo type setting. Also a fun one, it's God's job to forgive, it's my job to arrange the meeting. Sure, there's a morality out there somewhere, not my job to judge, just to do my job. One of the more moral strategies you can have, they've crossed this line in the sand, they made the choice to cross that line, now it's time to take them out. And of course, violence is only an option when it's the only option. Something to keep in mind when you are building your character's strategy is how they behave around ranged weapons. When we're talking about martial arts, which is in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which is what most of today's talk is about, most of these people have also trained with a ranged weapon of some kind. They have their CCW or some ranged weapon that they will prefer to use until the battle gets to the point where they then kick in with their martial art or melee training. This allows for a versatility in the combat for the team. A lot of people who understand how to kill people would rather work in a team. They know each other's strengths and weaknesses and then they can account for them and trust their team to help protect them. A lot of these people in the teams will have a preference. Yeah, this guy does know how to smack people upside the head, but he would rather have the sniper rifle because there's less threat to him. Another thing to know about strategy and ranged weapons is cover fire. When people are laying down cover fire, they are not slowly targeting each person. It's just what we call a spray and pray. Just get a whole bunch of ammo down line and this will just force the other guys to hide for a moment so that you can get your team members where they need to go. When you're fighting against ranged weapons, you need to have a specific strategy for your team as a whole. Generally, that comes down to moving closer to them, so you're taking away their advantage and bringing about your own. If you're moving farther away, then you're just giving them more advantage. Friendly fire is also something to consider when you're writing these kinds of scenes, because if 
your archers are firing at that team and then you also send in your swordsmen, you have to stop the archers. Otherwise, you're going to hit all of yours as well as theirs. Working as a team is always going to be the best way to take them down. You have your tank out there distracting them, taking all of the attention, all of the fire, so that your, the rest of your team can go and take out the snipers wherever they are. The environment. Whenever you are writing a fight scene, the environment is a character in that scene. We'll talk more about how to lay out notes for your fight scene uh, closer to the end, but something to keep in mind is make sure your environment is playing a factor in the combat. Cover is a huge part of that. If you have characters hiding behind a stone pillar or a wall or going in and out of buildings, this is especially helpful against ranged types of opponents. Um, many shields fall under the cover rules, especially in like D&D or tower shield, because you need to hide behind it. They're, you're just sort of carrying the cover with you. Um, when you understand the environment and how which pieces will work as cover, that will help you choreograph the movements on the map, on the field of the battle that you're writing. And of course, it can work against your characters as well. You can bottleneck with cover. You can pin someone down against a wall so they have nowhere to run. Getting characters trapped is a great use of using your environment in your combat scene. It can also be used as a weapon. If you have bendy things or fluid things in your scene, these are the things that are gonna be most helpful. So something like you knock my character onto the ground, they scoop up a fistful of sand and throw it in the guy's eyes. That gives them time to get up. Those types of things are great if we're running through the woods and somebody's chasing me and I hold a branch and then release it as late as possible. It whacks him in the face. Great use of environment as a weapon in that particular moment. Also understand, many characters have a preferred terrain. If Legolas is underground, he feels awkward. But you put him in a forest, he is at his peak. So having that preferred terrain and knowing who prefers what will help you interact with the environment the best way possible. Of course, treat that environment as its own character. Yes, you can have like animals that are also as part of it, but if they aren't aligned, they are part of the environment, not necessarily part of each team. Bottlenecking is another great way to use your environment and it playing a part in how the battle falls and also understanding the goals outside of winning. We're going to talk more about that in a minute, but having specific, we need to get this person out of the battle is more interesting than we're facing off and we're hoping that I'll win and they'll lose. Weapons. When you're talking about your martial art and how your characters specifically fight, weapons are going to be a huge part of their training and their strategy. Most martial arts will train with fists, but they'll also train with weapons. Karate is kind of the exception in that regard, where you'll start off training as with just fists, but most martial arts will also advance onto weapons. I think Aikido starts with stick weapons, but most people start with fists. When you have the weapons or your fists, you're going to be disarming and tripping as well. A lot of your martial arts based around how the body physically moves. The more exotic the weapon you choose it, the more exotic your, the weapon your character chooses, the less likely the other guy has trained against it. So if I have a sword, I'm coming at you and you have a sword. I've practiced against people with swords before. If I have a sword and you have a whip chain that also can break so stuff sonically, whatever it is, I have no idea how to go against that, so you have an advantage against me just because of the exotic level of your weapon. That being said, most weapons are treated as an extension of the body. So if I know how to punch you, I can also stab you. Same movement. Um, if you have practiced one, you can get to the other very easily. So 
people who are very good at the empty fist thing, you put a weapon in their hands, they'll be much better at it than someone who's only trained with the weapon. Historically, a lot of your weapons started off as farm tools. The sai were used to go into the hay bales and pick them up and move them. Tridents, same thing, you're mucking or you're fishing. Nunchucks are basically a stick that's been broken in half and reattached. Size, good for harvesting weed. Ropes, all over the place. Uh, rope darts are an extension of that. Blocking, something to understand about blocking when your character is trying to make sure nobody's hurting them. They're protecting vulnerable parts. They've kind of accepted that they're going to get hit. Generally speaking, you want to use a hard surface against a soft surface. That's going to be the best way to deal damage if you're on the hard surface side. Blocking is meeting a hard surface with a hard surface. You're both gonna hurt afterward, but you've protected the soft surfaces. So instead of going forehead against forehead, you're better off striking forehead against nose. So if somebody's coming at your nose, drop your chin and then they'll hit the forehead instead, you're better off. Knee to groin, again, hard surface, soft surface. Forearm to bicep, so there's a lot more meat here than there is here. Don't forget, blocking hurts. It's very easy to go to the Mortal Kombat mentality of they're blocking so they aren't getting hurt. Yes, it still hurts a lot. Successfully hitting someone can also hurt too. You see characters with bruised and bloody knuckles. Even if they won the fight, it'll hurt. When you're blocking with the forearm and the, the knee or lower leg, you're lifting the block. These are things that will still bruise and a lot of your defensive wounds will be found here uh, in crime victims because they're, they're trying to protect themselves. Defensive stances, do not try to do a tornado kick if you're being defensive. These are things that you need to do in order to stay protected and then you move in for the, the strike when you see the opportunity. So having both feet on the ground is going to give you the best defense against somebody. Arms up by the head. Um, my teacher said, you're answering a phone. That's generally about where it is. You'll see a lot of boxers especially do that, protecting their ears. And then if they're coming toward your core, you're dropping your elbow. You're, you're using gravity to help you block all of the squishy stuff underneath. So you get a little more coverage that way if you start high. Choosing a martial art. This, a lot of this has to do with style and just basically how much pizzazz your character has on the battlefield. But how you choose it for your character has a lot to do with not only their strategy, but their history. So if your character starts off in the military or as part of the police, local police force versus if they grew up in a dojo, they grew up on the streets, how they choose how much mercy they want to have, all of that has to do with the character's backstory. Most law enforcement are going to be submission based. They want to arrest the guy, not kill the guy. Military, kind of the opposite. Fewer of those guys possible, the better off our side is. Where they originate also plays a part in which martial art they're going to learn. The US, we had a burst after Karate Kid where we kind of got a whole bunch of the martial arts here and then MMA also boosted that. But most martial arts are going to be outlawed in China which is funny because that's kind of where the father of martial arts, Kung Fu, comes from. Um, but Russia has a very different style than most of the Chinese styles because Sambo is a part of their military as well. Hollywood also plays a part because I watch Karate Kid, now I want to learn karate. Also, when you're choosing a martial art, these are some of the questions that you want to ask yourself before you narrow down which martial art you want them to have. Do you want them to have an open or closed fist? A lot of the Kung Fu, we're using lots of different hand shapes in order to deal damage. 
Sambo or uh, a lot of the boxing, Wing Chun, those kind of things are going to have the closed fist more often. Um, is it a linear like karate? It's you know, straight from the hip. Or is it circular like Kung Fu? Where you've got that circular motion. If you're fighting for sport, so you're fighting in tournaments, or are you fighting to kill? Are you fighting for your own life? Do you care about the other person surviving or not? Are you going for submission or damage? A very similar question, but their motivations as far as tournaments can be a little different. Are they ground-based or top-heavy? My martial art that I am part of is very top-heavy. Most of the bottom half of my body is just staying stable on the ground so my hands can move. Moving with, the, with a punch, with a strike, is in order to aid the strike, as compared to something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where they're on the ground most of the time. They're very ground-heavy. Are they fighting for endurance or speed? Are they trying to get into and out of the fight as quickly as possible? Or are they hoping to outlast their enemies? How long does it take for them to get street ready? If you're going for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it takes like a decade, depending on discipline and all that. But if you're going for karate, it's much faster to be street ready. And are you going for more pinpoint accuracy or brute force? This goes back to the open and closed fist. Um, I, one of the things I was taught is you aim small, you miss small. But if you're going for brute force, you're just trying to barrel through the guy, get and do as much damage as quickly as possible. This is a chart that will be available afterward. This is some of the martial arts that when I was doing some digging into it that might give you an idea of how to pick which martial art that would best fit your character. The flavor here, that's actually based on the TV show Avatar, The Last Airbender. Each martial art and each element bending is, has a very specific style. The water bending and the healing is very Tai Chi as compared to the fire is very nerve point damage and very specific in that regard. So Kung Fu does have some fire as well as my particular martial art is more air and ground, but you've got the different kinds of weapons that they're doing, different kinds of things that they're used for, um, and like the different strategies they have here. Again, this will be available afterward if you wanted to take a closer look at some of these. These are all very cliche, but it'll give you a start in order to find somebody who does Aikido on YouTube, who you can then start to study the martial art a little bit further. Outside of combat is, is as important as inside of combat as far as how your character is behaving. One of those things is situational awareness. Aware characters will behave differently. Are they aware of their surroundings? They are entering a room and they're spotting the exits immediately. They're staying away from windows, especially if they've been opposed to snipers in the past. They're keeping track of who's going in and out of the building, even if they aren't actively watching the exits. They're keeping track of the kinds of people who are in the room. They're immediately spotting a threat level on each person. If you're trained with a martial art or you're trained with a weapon, it becomes pretty easy to identify if that person's carrying a weapon or not. Again, use your environment. Identify the weapons that are within reach. If your character is drinking a cup of coffee and someone comes and tries to throw a punch at them, they're not going to put the coffee down first. Jack Reacher might because he really likes coffee. Everyone else is going to throw the coffee into his face. Use that time to react. And then when they're sitting in a chair, their feet are not going up on anything. They're not crossing their legs, that kind of thing. They're keeping both feet on the floor so that they can get up and out quickly. They're also not going to intentionally put themselves in dangerous situations unless they have a very good reason. Most of the people who are not situationally aware don't even recognize that walking through a dark parking lot at night, playing on your phone with your purse dangling off of your elbow is a bad idea. <laughs> if, you, if your character is situationally aware, they're just not going to park in a place 
that is going to be dark at night. The goal in a lot of this situational awareness is to just not be the weakest gazelle. Somebody else is going to be the target first. Make yourself an unappetizing target of having your head up and looking around. That is 90% of self-defense, is just not being a target. They're also going to be the person to keep track of their companions. So they're going to be probably the sober one, the one who's making sure that everyone is in a safe place and within reach that they can protect pretty easily. And depending on the companion, they might trust them to have their back too. So if they've both trained together, they might be okay sitting with their back against the door because they know the person across from them can see the door and they're trusting that person to react. It's very common to write that training montage don't forget, your character is probably going to feel a strike during that training montage. If not, I don't have any faith in their teacher. Before they can even deliver a punch, they have to feel a punch. Otherwise, they're just going with their best guess. And it becomes very terrifying on the battlefield afterward. They need to see the danger coming at them again and again. That's why you face off in a martial arts class. You're seeing that punch coming at you over and over and over again. That trains you to not flinch, not shy away, to approach the combat instead of be a victim in a real fight. They have to accept that they will hurt and maybe even kill people during the combat. That is a decision you have to make during the training montage, not during the fight itself. If you think during combat, you're late, you're dead. There should be many trials and specific things that they learn during this training montage, especially if there's a hyper-specific or intricate move that they use <coughs> during the final combat. Karate Kid's a popular example of that. You see him do the, the crane kick. We see him learn that so that he can use it in the final combat. It looks very weird and a little deus ex machina, and especially if you're doing it in writing a novel format, this is going to be a way for your reader to understand what's happening quickly because they studied the move ahead of time. Causes of death, we're moving on to the body. Um, every Buddy keeps their kneecaps in the same place. We mentioned that earlier. So the body only bends certain ways. Your elbow is not going to bend the other way. That is a strategy of some martial arts to just bend things the wrong direction. Those are your leverage-based type martial arts. Causes of death come down to only a couple of things. You can die from dehydration. You can die from some kind of organ failure. And you can die from oxygen, blood, limb loss, you lose your head. Only a couple things actually kill somebody, but there are a lot of ways to get there. So some people will prefer poisons. Poisons cause dehydration. Bleeding out can cause dehydration. Um, shredding, you know, antifreeze will crystallize in your blood and then shred the inside of the veins, make you bleed out. That's part of a poison but you can also use a melee weapon to have someone bleed out. There are lots of ways to kill people. Lots of ways to get there. So know whatever it is in your body, know what it does, and know where to find it. So if you're trying to stab me in the heart here, you better have a very strangely shaped weapon because that's not gonna get there. So if you know that they've been punched in the kidneys three times prior to this fight, that's going to be a soft spot. Know where the kidneys are and get to them. This will help you understand how a character dies and make writing that fight leading up to the death and the death itself a lot more realistic. Of course, you may not be killing them, but they're still going to hurt. Have a purpose for inflicting pain. Sometimes it's getting the person to move. In the fight scene I was choreographing for my novel last week, we were talking about doing a wrist lock. And the wrist only goes a certain distance before 
you want to move the whole body with it in order to not break the wrist itself. Getting the guy to stop. So if you just bop somebody, break their nose, then they're going to stop. <laughs> they're going to back away. There's go you're going to add distance between you, which might be your only goal in getting away. Or sometimes you're buying time for an ally. You get them in that chicken wing and you're inflicting a lot of pain so that the ally can come up and then do, turn them into goo. Some areas on the body are more sensitive than others. This goes back to the soft versus hard thing. If you're trying to hit me on the hard part of my skull, you're, even a single knuckle is not going to do a whole lot. It's gonna hurt you uh, as much as it hurts me. If you're going for that spot behind the ear, there are three nerve clusters there. And so if you miss, you might hit another one, great. Most nerve clusters are about the size of a dime, which is conveniently about the same size as a single knuckle. So you clock them that way. Nerve endings and nerve clusters can incapacitate. So you can shut a body down, the Vulcan nerve pinch, the way he's doing it isn't really a thing that can be done, but you can shut somebody down by touching the right nerves. Um, a, an example you might have experienced in this is you lose uh, power in your pinkies and your ring fingers when you hit your funny bone. That's going to just kill a lot of your arm and your hand movement for a minute. It's not long, but you're buying time by inflicting pain. Each layer of your body has a different purpose. So if you're going for the skin, the outermost layer, that's going to be inflicting pain without doing a whole lot of damage. So you're gripping as little of the flesh as possible. I don't know if you had siblings growing up, but it's very common to do the whole Indian burn thing or pinching a little bit of skin. Those hurt more than grabbing a whole fistful of skin. They don't really do a lot. You recover pretty quickly from that. It just hurts in the moment because that's where all your nerve endings are. If you're going a little bit deeper, your muscles and your nerves, you're going to have a temporary loss of use. If you hit the radial nerve here, they're not gonna be able to use much of their hand well for a few seconds at least. That buys you a fair amount of time. If you're going for the bone and just breaking the arm entirely, that is a permanent, or at least until the end of the fight, loss of use. If you break my femur here, I'm not doing much with this leg, at least for the rest of the fight. Feeling pain. This is very important in choreography. People will curl into pain. If you hit me in my solar plexus, I'm not gonna go, eh, because then I'm offering it to you. It's the human instinct to cover it, to hide under it, to make sure that it's protected. As a practitioner, you're going to use that to set up the next strike. You hit me in the solar plexus, my chin is going out and down. Go back up, and now my hips are forward, my head is back. Groin is an option. These are all things that will help you choreograph and set up a skilled fighter in combat. If they're not skilled, they're going to probably comprehend and like have a slower reaction time because they're seeing the stuff happening versus anticipating it's happening and that's why you're doing it in the first place. It also takes a split second to feel. This is something that Hollywood lies to you about. You don't feel it right away. There's a very, very, very short delay in that. It also takes time to recover from pain. So if you whack my funny bone, it's gonna be a minute before I can get use of those fingers. It's very important that even if your character wins the fight, they're not going to be unscathed. They are going to have some kind of pain that's dealt to them. Some blows will still land. The other guy will still win a couple of hits in there. Your character will feel that for weeks to come. Also, accepting the magic systems that Lee was talking about earlier, people need time to heal. Unless you have a character who goes, bloop, all better, or they have superpowers or whatever it is. That is a hugely overlooked storytelling tool because especially in that big loss before the final conflict, 
they can still have that broken arm or whatever it is. Let that be a disadvantage so that your heroes can succumb much more, surmount much more. The other option, of course, is to have somebody who can heal. There are some things to avoid because it drives people like me nuts when we're reading these kind of fights. First, Hollywood is not real life. Kicks are much cooler on screen, but they're very difficult to deliver well. That's partially my bias in my martial art, but it's very easy to go, I'm gonna kick this guy because he's farther away, and that is a terrible plan on several different ways. Get in close, hit him with a strike so you're still stable. Rolls are mostly just used defensively. You're not going to roll away or roll to pick up a weapon unless you have a very specific kind of training for that. But if your character is rolling around the battlefield, do we have a question? Keep, keep finish okay. If your character is just rolling around the battlefield and your villain can predict where they're rolling, they'll just punt them. This is, she's asking why kicks are vulnerable. This is also goes in line with the parkour we were talking about before. You wanna have at least two, if possible, three points of contact. In parkour, sometimes that's up, sometimes that's one foot and one arm. There are a lot of, they're more three-dimensional thinkers. Most martial arts are more linear. If I am kicking, I only have one point of contact on the ground. And if I'm kicking out, someone's kicking out at me, it's very easy to scoop it, just keep lifting. They're gonna end up on their butt. They, there are martial arts that train for that. They learn how to fall. Everyone should learn how to fall. It'll save your life. But using kicks in combat, you have to have a very specific purpose and a very specific technique. The 360 tornado kick in Taekwondo looks super cool, but like the flying horse even, which is when you would just go and you fly straight at them, that's karate. These are things that you can see coming and just go Whoop, because they're so dramatic and set up and then the person just falls and then you're done. You, all you have to do is sort of do the Aikido out of the way, bye. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Okay. Make sure your character is fighting to win it's very easy to write the Batman character of, oh, I won't kill you, and that gives me the moral high ground. Um, that is a very dangerous and unrealistic expectation for your character to maintain. Also understand that if the characters are just trading punches and then they walk away, that seems like a very unrealistic fight. Most fights end up on the ground at some point, especially if there's a female in the fight. Females carry their weight a lot lower than males do. So, and a lot of males attacking females will try to get them on the ground. So it's common for them to try to get one person to get the other person on the ground. Sometimes that's just Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. They're just gonna wait until the other person gets on the ground with them. Injuries don't disappear after the blast of pain goes away. If you tag me across the face, there's a stun moment and then there's a little bit of adrenaline, but I can still feel that the rest of the fight, at least unless I have a healer behind me going beep, tag, you're healed. Kick them in the groin as many times as possible. I see a lot of people going, well, I already kicked him in the groin, I already need him in the groin. The groin still hurts, do it again, and again after that. There are some things you should do instead. These are good techniques to integrate into your fight. Use your team. We know that no plan survives the battlefield, no plan survives first contact, but experienced teams last longer. You can do more if they are practiced and working together. Also, knowing who is who and who is where will help avoid friendly fire. And of course, please have your characters communicate with each other. If I am anticipating waiting to hear a go from Lee while I'm in combat, that triggers 
my whole team to shift strategies somehow, then it'll take them longer to comprehend than it will be for me to execute because I'm anticipating that sound. Let your characters communicate. They don't have to be secret communications even. Just have them talking to each other because often the other side might be able to try to block that strategy, but it's definitely going to be an advantage in the drama of your story. Have a goal in your combat aside from winning. These are things like protecting the damsel in distress, or all we're trying to do is just get into the castle, breach the gate. One character is trying to disarm the bomb or trying to distract the bad guy so that the bomb goes off. Having these goals aside from just surviving the fight make it a lot more interesting. Especially if your readers don't understand martial arts, these are some things that uh, my mom can follow. Protecting the damsel, okay, they've moved the damsel over here and fighting stuff happens, that's okay. They're still following the fight because they're understanding the goals aside from winning. And of course, err on the side of awesome. Your hero is a hero, not an everyday person, so if it would just be cooler to do something like this, set it up as much as possible, but feel free to just make it cool. I do get a lot of questions about army combat of one force versus another force. The I, main thing to keep in mind here is there are two elements of the combat, big and small. So there's the this army versus that army, one has to cross the bridge and that kind of uh, risk if you play that board game. Combat, and then the intimate combat, what your point of view character is going through in that exact moment. The big combat is the concern of the leaders mostly. If your, character, your point of view character is not a leader, they might vaguely understand the strategy. They might be looking at banners and trying to get some kind of communication. But for the most part, their whole goal is just to survive so they can go home after the fight. A lot of these strategies are based on uh, environment as much as numbers, especially post-American uh, Revolutionary War, because we introduced kind of a guerrilla tactic that stopped the force versus force on the battlefields. So that was a lot of the colonists' idea and strategy that helped them win the Revolutionary War. Have specific teams of people for specific things. This is incredibly helpful when you have a complex environment, like a castle. So this team, their job is just to hold the battering ram and break down as many doors as possible. Survive as long as you can, but break down doors. That's your goal. Then this team, they're all left-handed, so they can get up the spiral staircase a lot easier than the right-handed folks can. These kinds of having specific teams makes it easier to understand the battle as a whole. And of course, music and flags are used to communicate to the entire army. They're not just cheerleaders. The, the pipes, you know, the bagpipes and the flutes and the drums and these kind of things. Different songs mean different things to different teams. So when you hear it go from when the saints go marching in to battle hymn of the Republic, that means it's time to do this. Know when to fall back and surrender. This is what makes a leader good. Not the pushing forward, but to know when to spare your men's lives. On the individual side, this is an individual single person in the military. Their main goal, again, survive as long as possible. Guy's coming at me, I'm going to block and try to kill him before he kills me, moving on. There's no, someone else trying to kill me, I'll kill him next. They might have a possible second goal. In uh, the case of Lord of the Rings, they're trying to light the beacons of Gondor. They might be trying to hold their ground as long as possible. They're buying time for the heroes to get to Mount Doom. The last bit of advice I wanted to give you is to fight before you write. Before you write any of the little details down, walk through the motions as much as possible. Build a choreography chart, that's next, but you have different columns. Those are your different participants in the fight. If the environment is playing a major role, 
you have a column for the environment, stuff that's happening there. They get to the stream and then the stream can help sweep people away or whatever it is. Your rows in this choreography chart are the different phases in the fight. So if you're playing D&D with us, you recognize we kind of have a turn-based system, but there are stuff happening, things happening within the turns. Your rows are your different phases of combat. First this happens, then this, then this. Walk through the motions. I cannot stress how important this is. If you don't fully understand, walk through it, feel it. Because, and it's okay to practice alone if necessary. Just, you don't have to be good at it. You can look stupid. Make sure it's physically possible for your character to do whatever it is they're doing. And of course, if there's a tangle that you need someone else with, I encourage Barbies and GI Joes. They don't fully move like humans do, but they will have a lot of the limbs don't bend that way, and that would avoid a lot of the issues I see in authors writing fight scenes. Have an expert to call on if you can. Go back to that martial arts chart, find a local dojo, watch them practice, talk to the instructor. Say, hey, can I call on you when I have questions? They might say no. There are groups online as well. But building these connections have a great advantage of making sure something feels realistic to somebody who knows what they're doing. You get a great beta reader that way. And then they're likely talking about the book to all of their fans. And then you, guess what? Have the market as sort of a secondary advantage to having an expert. Feeling it will help you describe it. Again, you'll probably feel a little bit of pain. They know better than to hurt you. They're good at what they do. They'll help you make sure it's physically possible. And if absolutely necessary, you can call me. You all have my Discord channel. You all have my Facebook. Let me know if you have questions about combat. I'm always happy to answer them because, again, killing people. This is what a choreography chart looks like. This is the final fight that I wrote for Seventh Siphon, which I just finished like a couple days ago. Doric is a magic user. He's the bad guy. Olivia is the main good guy. Aiden has um, a bow and arrow, and that's his pet soul, which is a falcon. So first thing that happens in this part of the fight is he's going to block one of her strikes and turn her around. So she's turning her back to him. He's going to stomp the top of her calf, so she's driven to one knee. So stomp calf, down on one knee. Next thing, he's going to try to pull that blade in. She's going to lock that wrist instead. And then sweep the foot back, tossing him over her. That's the whole thing. After he lands, Soul's going to come by, dive bomb, take a chunk of his shoulder with him, and fly off again. This is how you write out a choreography chart. Especially if you're working with an expert, you can fill this out. Then you can go back later and fill out all the narrative portions. So this end part here moves into this next part here. Again, this is a final fight, so it's a little bit long. Most of your fight scenes won't have more than seven or eight of these rows. You want it to be fast, otherwise it feels like everyone's kind of incompetent. So this is my meme. Bormir's in a fight. Well, he's played by Sean Bean, you stupid blonde. He'll never survive. We all know Sean Bean doesn't survive anything he's ever a part of. So, with that, enjoy your fighting, enjoy your writing, and write selfishly. If you have a question or comment for our hosts or a topic you'd like us to cover, send us an email at writingroots at aspenhousepublishing.com or find us on Facebook by searching for Aspen House Publishing. 